Maybe you see them full Perfect. screen now. Yeah. That's no. great. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, I'll go ahead and start. So my name is Emilio Martinez Pañeda, as you heard. I'm a lecturer at Imperial College London, and I'm going to present the work that we have done recently over the past two, three years on using phase field based methods to create a numerical framework, a multiphysics numerical framework to capture hydrogen assisted fraction fatigue. I should say that this is work that I've done in collaboration with um, my good friend Christian Yorson at DTU and two students, two very bright students that we have supervised, Philip and Algesa. And uh, some of the results that will be shown that will be showing are have been published in these two papers, but there's also new results that are part of ongoing works. So first of all, what is this hydrogen assisted fracture? What is this hydrogen embrittlement? Well, this is quite an old problem. As you can see in the slide, it was first reported by Johnson in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1875. And he writes about some remarkable changes producing iron and steel, some extraordinary decreasing toughness and breaking strain of iron. And you very rarely see words such as remarkable or extraordinary in scientific papers, particularly in those days. But the truth is that the effect of hydrogen in metals is truly remarkable and extraordinary. What you see here, for example, is how hydrogen reduces the ductility of metals. So you can see here a uniaxial stress strain curve, and you can see that if we expose our samples to hydrogen, for example, here to hydrogen gas, you can see that the, du the ductility of the failure strain is very drastically reduced. Hydrogen also decreases quite drastically the fracture toughness of metals. You can see here a fracture toughness plot versus hydrogen pressure. And you can see how a steel that fails at 150 megapascal square meter can go well below 40 megapascal square meter as we keep increasing the hydrogen concentration. And this is for a low strength steel. For a high strength steel, you can see a reduction by 90% of the fracture toughness. And this is a very important point to emphasize. The susceptibility to hydrogen damage increases with the strength of the material. You can see here the fracture toughness for a fixed concentration of hydrogen. So, so this is a, an environment that mimics seawater. And you can see how as you increase the yield strength, the toughness goes down drastically up to the point that it goes below 10 megapascals a square root meter. So almost like a ceramic. And th this is a really important point because what this is telling is, what this is telling us is that basically first, Hydrogen is compromising decades of metallurgical research. We have developed high performance materials, but we cannot use them. And second is that when using high strength steels, which we try to use when using modern alloys, we are seeing these hydrogen assisted fractures in many environments and conditions where we never expected to see them before. So traditionally, hydrogen embrittlement was a problem related to aggressive environments, such as those of offshore structures. But now we want to use high strength steels in our buildings, in our cars, in our railways. And this is leading to hydrogen embrittlement in otherwise very benign environments. For example, you can see here, this is a very famous skyscraper in London. And you can see that it's a newspaper article reporting hydrogen embrittlement just because of the humidity, the hydrogen that is coming in just because of the humidity. And of course, you have seen in the newspapers and in the media quite a lot of hype about this hydrogen economy and, and how can hydrogen be one of the solutions to our energy crisis and you can imagine how problematic it's going to be to store and transport hydrogen to to fuel cars buses uh, trains which are already in the market this one is in london actually the one at the bottom is taken from london so you might wonder at this point how can it be that 150 years after johnson almost 150 years after johnson's paper in the proceedings of the royal society and the uh, given the importance of hydrogen that is a future energy vector that is affecting many sectors and applications how can it be that it's still a problem how can it be that not only those hydrogen assisted fractures are be not only they're not going down but they're becoming more and more frequent well the reason is because oh, there's multiple reasons one of them is that it's a very complex micromechanical and chemical problem so it's, it really crosses the boundaries of material science mechanics chemistry structural mechanics so it's a quite a nasty problem we do understand the basics. So we do understand that we have a metal exposed to an environment that has hydrogen atoms or hydrogen molecules. This could be seawater, this could be the water vapor, this could be maybe hydrogen that comes in during the manufacturing process like welding. And then you have these hydrogen atoms that enter the material, travel relatively fast. So 
roughly 10 microns per second in a ferritic lattice. And, and then they accumulate in areas of high stress where you have higher volumetric strain, so you expand the lattice and there's more space for the hydrogen atoms to sit in. Then what happens when you have hydrogen in these areas of high stress in this fracture process zone? That is quite complicated because hydrogen interacts with the material at many, at many, at many scales and in many different ways. So it reduces the bonding strength of metal, metal atoms. It changes the dislocation mobility. It stabilizes vacancy. So it's a quite a complicated and nasty picture. And there's also, a, a, so it is a very, I think the summary or the takeaway is that it's a very complex problem to understand. And also because, of course, that is a big problem because it makes it a very big problem to model. So not only is a multi physical problem, multidisciplinary problem, but also multi scale. So it's quite complicated to model. And as a consequence, if we don't have models, we cannot predict when these hydrogen assisted fractures will happen. We cannot predict if the gas pipelines can be used to transport hydrogen gas and so on. So I tried to work on this. I tried to develop a, a suitable computational framework to, to predict when these hydrogen assisted failures will happen. And this framework has several ingredients that I will try to walk you through. So one is diffusion. You need to model how hydrogen diffuses within the metal. In the standard or the most simplest diffusion model is the one that you see in the slide, which is based on Fick's law. So it's an extended version of Fick's law. You can see that it depends on the hydro on the gradient of the hydrostatic stress. So as I said before, the higher the hydrostatic stress, the more space there is for the hydrogen to accumulate. And what we have been working is in developing also multi-trap models. So another thing that we understand very well is that hydrogen not only travels through the crystal lattice, but also likes to sit in some microstructural traps. So to say they're, they're called micro they're traps, hydrogen traps. So these are, for example, grains, dislocations, carbides, for which it is energetically favorable for the hydrogen to to sit there instead of travel freely through the crystal lattice. So we need to account for these things. And this is quite important in order to be able to predict fracture. For example, as you can imagine, in cases where the hydrogen, where the fracture is intergranular, so you need to determine how much hydrogen is sitting in those green boundaries. So we have extended, this is one area where we have been working, developing chemistry or transport models that are able to capture not only how the hydrogen diffuses through the lattice, but also how it can be trapped in different areas and how this affects diffusion. Another part that we have been working is trying to figure out how much hydrogen gets in. So this is related to chemistry and electrochemistry. Before I was mentioning this part on the on the right hand side, but now we are also working on this developing generalized boundary conditions. These are Neumann type boundary conditions to determine actually how much hydrogen you is ingressing into your metal to resolve the electrochemistry diffusion interface. That is basically the goal. And I, I won't get into the details for, for the lack of time. This is work with Alan Turnbull at NPL. I would just say that this, let's say, more rigorous or more sophisticated generalized boundary conditions uh, are come with some numerical complexities, but they do seem to predict very different results to the more simplistic approach of using a Dirichlet boundary condition of prescribing a hydrogen concentration at the interface. So I think that it is important to to incorporate these new theoretical and numerical formulations. There's another element of the modeling, which is, of course, the deformation of the solid, how the solid behaves. Uh, this is, and, and of course, as, as in any problem, you need to think what scale is the dominant one in your problem. And there is an obvious trade off between uh, resolving the underlying physics and uh, computational efficiency. Atomist, uh, continuing models are what we are aimed for, what we are looking for, because we want to be able to predict at the scales relevant to, to engineering practice. But of course, if all the all, all the magic is happening in the first three atoms ahead of your crack, then you need atomistic resolution. Otherwise, you won't be able to capture. In the case of hydrogen embrittlement, cracking occurs at a few microns ahead of the crack tip or one micron ahead of the crack tip, depends on the material, so very close to the crack tip, at a scale where ideally one would like to model these locations individually rather than using a continuum model. However, uh, what we do is we see, we compare a continuum model with discrete dislocation predictions and we see where the differences lie. And the difference, the main difference that you miss when you use conventional Vomesis plasticity theory is that at a few microns ahead of the crack tip, the stresses are much higher due to the presence of what we call GMDs, geometrically necessary dislocations that are associated with plastic strain gradients and the need to accommodate lattice curvature. So we have been working in developing this, what are called strain gradient plasticity theories, which is an extension of plasticity to the microscale. 
And these theories are typically higher order. So as you can see here, you have some higher order stresses where conjugate to plastic strain gradients and, and some also some higher order tractions. And, uh, and these theories incorporate a lens scan. In that way, you are able to capture the effect of these GNDs, what we see in many microscale experiments and also in inclusions and, and cracks. And you can see here that the main difference when you use these two models, so this is stresses ahead of a crack, this is conventional plasticity, the dashed line and the blue line is strength room plasticity, what you see is the stresses are much higher. And this is very important, of course, not only because fracture will take place at a level of a given level of stress, but also because uh, the amount of hydrogen that you will have close to your crack tip <coughs> is very sensitive to this hydrostatic stress. You can see here that at steady state, this is how the concentration looks like. So the hydrostatic stress comes into an exponential term. So it makes quite a big difference to get your stresses right at your critical distance. That's why we need to enrich our continuum theories. And I won't spend much time here. I will just say that it is difficult to measure hydrogen content ahead of a crack, but uh, from the few experimental measures that we have, we can see that these models seem to predict a much better agreement, that there is quite a lot of hydrogen close to the crack tip that you cannot capture if you don't account for these GNDs for these gradient effects. That takes me to the third part of our modeling work, which is the phase field and we had a we heard a very nice talk uh, before the first one in this session which explained the phase field so that's very nice i can go a bit faster through this what it just says that it has been a revolution in modeling microstructural problems the idea that you track an interface by using an implicit variable rather than applying boundary conditions of those interfaces and it has been a revolution in, in many areas microstructural evolution being one and fracture which is relevant here being the other one we have actually had quite a lot of fun working with this phase field fracture method and, and well, these are some of the papers that we have been working on, us on, on also from the literature. You can see that it's a very powerful and, and robust tool. Uh, my good friend Wei Tan will explain after me how we have used this in composites. So it's a very powerful tool from a computational perspective. And if you wonder how, okay, what is the physics of this phase field? How does this phase field evolve? It was very well explained in the previous talk, but it has to do with Griffith's energy balance. So it's a matter of having enough energy stored in your system to be able to propagate a crack. So it's, it's the result of applying thermodynamics to, to, to the propagation of cracks. And I'll just say that you can get a good overview of, of the problem by looking at these two equations. So you, you have the balance of linear momentum, which is degraded by the phase field. So the phase field is sort of like a damage variable. And then you have an evolutional equation for the phase field, which is uh, basically a competition between this fracture toughness of the solid, the toughness of the solid, and the strain energy density, the energy that accumulates in your solid. And just by solving this extra equation, you can capture on the original finite element mesh, very complex cracking behavior, like the one I'm showing on the screen. This is crack branching due to impact load. So you can capture merging of cracks, branching of cracks, nucleation from arbitrary sites, everything on the original finite element mesh for arbitrary geometries and, and, and for and dimensions. It is straightforward to do 3D, so this is very, powerful. How do we include the hydrogen in here? Well, what we see from the experiments, of course, is that the toughness of the material decreases with the hydrogen content. So it is immediate. Our model was the first model of facial fracture and hydrogen embrittlement, and we thought, okay, the best way to go on about it is to make the toughness of the material dependent on the hydrogen concentration, as we see in experiments. The question is, of course, how do you define that dependency, that function, right? You can make your and, and this is good because there's many possibilities that one can exploit. You can make the, your toughness dependent on the lattice hydrogen concentration, the hydrogen in those traps that I mentioned before, depending on the dislocation density. You can make it depending on any mechanistic interpretation. The logic that we follow is as follows. So we say, first of all, we run off, offline atomistic simulations. And when we run offline atomistic simulations, what we see is that the fracture energy decreases with the hydrogen occupancy. So Quantitatively, by running atomistic calculations, we can see how much the fracture energy uh, decreases with the hydrogen occupancy. And actually, what you see here is that if you if your if your interface is full of hydrogen, so that's an occupancy of one, you reduce your fracture energy by 40%. So that explains why hydrogen is, is so uh, dangerous for metals. The other element of our vision is that we look at the thermodynamics of, of trapping, and then we say, okay. Provide, let's say that we have a grain boundary. I want to understand why my metal, instead of failing in a ductile manner, fails in a brittle manner. And then I, what I do first is I plot here the trap occupancy as a function of what we call the binding energy. So how energetically favorable it's for the hydrogen to go to that grain boundary and the lattice hydrogen concentration. And you can see that 
For metals, which is a binding energy of minus 40, you need very little hydrogen concentration and you are immediately in that regime where your grain boundary is going to be full of hydrogen. So we can model this. We can model the traps and we can see how much hydrogen is in the grain boundary. And this is what they see, by the way, in experiment. This is a recent science paper where you can see all the hydrogen accumulating in the grain boundary. And then we couple this with our last element. So we know that the strength of a grain boundary or of a brittle uh, interface is going to be roughly 10 times the yield stress. So it's impossible that you get there, even if you bring it down with hydrogen, if you use conventional plasticity. But if you account for that stress elevation at the micro scale, you can, those lines will cross. So this is the idea, basically. We have this multiphysics, mechanistic, multi-scale hydrogen degradation law. You run some atomistic calculations offline, and then at the continuum level, you have this degradation of the toughness that is quantitatively given by atomistic calculations. You model stress-assisted diffusion. You model the trapping thermodynamics, so you know how much hydrogen you have in those uh, brittle interfaces, and then you know how much the hydrogen uh, reduces the frank to toughness. That is the idea. Another thing that I want to say is that Another element that we want to implement is what we call moving chemical boundary conditions. So imagine that you have a pipeline in the middle of the sea. The moment a crack propagates, the sea water is going to occupy that space, so the hydrogen is going to follow the crack, so to say. And this is what you see here. We can do that with a penalty approach. You see at the top the crack propagating, and at the bottom is the hydrogen concentration. So we, you, you need to incorporate that if you want to know what happens after your crack has initiated. And I won't get into details, but if you're interested, these are how what the residuals look like. So we're solving a problem where we solve for displacements, plastic strains, phase field, and hydrogen concentration as degrees of freedom. Some representative results to conclude the talk and show you how this model works. So this is what we call R cures of crack growth resistant cures. So this is the load versus crack extension. And you can see that we capture the, the experimental trends, which is that you, as you increase the hydrogen content, you bring down the, the fracture resistance of the solid. This shows that Another well-known experimental trend, which is the fact that if you load very fast, you're going to be more resistant to hydrogen damage because there's no enough, enough time for the hydrogen to travel to the fracture process zone. We also compare with experiments, of course. This is another representative result. These are uh, notched uh, steel bars, and you can see the experiments are symbols that we can capture very nicely the experimental trend uh, with, with our phase field model. This is a set of a bit more interesting experiments. So what you see here is, is an experiment done in Norway at Sintef. They had uh, several samples in a seawater bath. Each of those samples is loaded at a constant load, and they were hoping that the stress applied to at least one of those samples was low enough such that no cracking would be observed. However, all of those samples, you can see the symbols here, failed relatively early in, in engineering time scales. But with the model, we can run virtual experiments over very large time scales. So it allows us to determine what is this critical stress below which engineers can load their, their structures. And this good agreement with experiments uh, gave us confidence to approach our industrial partners and to apply these models to conduct virtual testing for the first time in hydrogen sensitive environments. You can see a couple of examples here, a crack propagating from corrosion pits, a pari of a high strength steel that failed to hydrogen embrittlement. But more excitingly, this is what we call sometimes a digital twin, right? A comparison with some inspection data. So on the top, you see this is from Nicola Rosa, uh, a characterization of a pipeline. This is a 12 kilometer pipeline, and you can see a lot of pits, these defects in red. We model a three meter critical section of that pipeline where we have those pits in there. And what you see here in the video is that we can, oops, sorry for that. What you see here in the video is that then we can subject this pipeline to in-service conditions and we can see how those pits nucleate, merge, and eventually you get the complete failure of the pipeline. So you can couple this with inspection data and you can predict precisely when these things are going to happen. And this looks very much like a video game, but let me emphasize that it's quite a sophisticated multiphysics simulation accounting for atomistic, micro scale, and, and, and chemical and physical elements of it. Just to finalize, I'll say that we have also extended to fatigue, where you can include a degradation function. And again, very good agreement with experiments. You can see it here. We can do virtual SN curves, and we can also do, as an outcome of the model, we can capture the Paris law behavior and the influence of the environment on the Paris law behavior, and we can do virtual SN curves on samples with different with uh, different geometries here. You can see, for example, with a notch sample. So just to conclude, I would just say that uh, I found the facial fracture method to be uh, fascinating. In all honesty, it is very robust and it can deal with very complex conditions, no convergence problems. 
very easy to implement, so we really had quite a lot of fun with it. We extended a new framework, the first framework to capture hydrogen embrittlement. This requires capturing the chemistry, the physics, the, the underlying mechanisms at both micro and atomic scales. And uh, this framework seems to be very good so far in, in capturing fracture and fatigue in, in both laboratory tests, but also in practical applications. So just finalize by saying that uh, all the codes are openly shared. We have implemented this in Abacus, Phoenix, and Comsol. Uh, that of course, uh, I, oh, that I'm, I'm very thankful to my sponsors and for all of you for attending and that I'm looking for a postdoc in multiphysics modeling. I will upload the, the advert to my website in, in, in a few days. So if you're interested, uh, don't hesitate to contact me or to send your application. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thanks for a very interesting talk, Emilio.